Podcast City Network. The Everett Lee Show. Welcome to a new episode of The Everett Lee Show. I'm The Everett Lee. Today on the program, I talk with director and film producer Steve Moon. Steve Moon, he's known for movies such as Ocean, 3.3 Miles, Out of the Fight. Steve Moon reached out and wanted to discuss and talk about Out of the Fight. Out of the Fight is a movie based on a veteran coming out of a tour from Afghanistan and dealing with the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder. And we talk about that, discuss about that, discuss about the film, Out of the Fight. And we talk and discuss about a lot of different things on here. Everything from music to a little bit of wrestling to just good conversation. And we talk about his movies and how he started there in Alabama and the connections and everything that he's done as a filmmaker and the ups and downs with that there too. And one good thing about this film out of the fight we discuss here on the podcast that he had nonprofit organizations such as Mission 22, We Are the Mighty and Taps who worked on the film with Steve Moon. I want to give a shout out recognition right there and just great conversation with the, with Steve Moon. I enjoyed it and I hope you all enjoy it right here so here it is. Film director and producer Steve Moon. How you doing Steve? Man, I'm so blessed I can't complain about that. God, uh, God gave me air in my lungs today so I'm happy, you know. <laughs> when you wake up looking like this every day uh, and you can do these things on podcasts instead of TV interviews, you're doing even better. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Podcast is the new FM AM radio because I the only time I actually listen to FM radio is when I'm at my at my job. Besides all the stuff that I do with Podcast C Network and other projects, the only time I yep. listen to radio is at work and it's background noise, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, are there any radio stations that play rock anymore? I mean, I'm old school. I like the old school stations. Uh, but, man, it just, I mean, is there just, uh, there you go. There you go. Hey, we have to give a shout out also. Uh, Fred Durst, that's almost say. Fred, I hope you're listening, man. What's going on? But ACD. <laughs> He's got the ACDC shirt on also, so I don't. Uh, I guess we can't shout out to anybody for that. Yeah, I'm. I'm a big classic rock fan. You're talking about classic rock. I love ACDC. As you see, I'm sporting ACDC right. Back in Black, one of my favorite ACDC Back albums. Black. Absolutely. Yeah, and then Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, what, two of my favorites. I listen to all the time. Dio. I listen to the hard, the hard classic rock, man. I mean, I. What, I, what about Quiet Riot? And we'll go a little bit, you know, smoother, classic rock, uh, Van Halen. Because I'm I, oh God. a different category, but, dude, I'm Van Halen all the way, man. Van Halen. Tell you a little story here. First introduction to Van Halen was 1984. I was five years old. That's when MTV first came out. I have, I have older brothers. One of my older brothers, who was still at home, was watching MTV. I walked in the room, and all I see is this guy on the stage, David Lee Roth, in these leopard pants, and he's doing the <laughs> jump and the splits, and it was the video for Jump. I just stood there and watched it right next to him. I was like, who is this? I wanted to be like David Lee Roth at five years old. I got on top of the corner of my couch, and I jumped off, and I was <laughs> imitating the video. My parents said, boy, you jump off that couch again, we're gonna whip your ass. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I, jump five years is old. My favorite. I, I, I love. I was fourteen when Jump came out, but yeah, Jump is that. That's my jam, dude. That that is my jam. And I'll say also, old school Oak Ridge Boys fan. I went to Oak Ridge Boys four years ago. That's why I'm growing up this beard a little, a little bit because my wife uh, is in love with William Lee Golden. Like, I'll say this real quick because I know I interrupted you, but man, we went to the concert. William Lee Golden in his seventies. Quartet singing out there, Oak Ridge Boys, and then here comes William Lee with, with the solo. And these girls in the audience, 20, 25 years old, just going nuts over this sexy, long, gray-haired, gray-beard man. And 
and then my wife, of course, and you know, she's going crazy. I'm like, okay, I'm glad I came. This is good, good stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, Oak Ridge Boys, man, they 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 did a lot in music, believe it or not, and and they they've done a lot, and they had a lot of hits and stuff. They they made that crossover. I mean, they they got that yes. contemporary, and then to the Christian, and to I mean, they go they go back all over all over the place. They're almost multi talented, like Queen. I'm a big fin, fan of Queen because Queen they do everything from hard rock to ballads to everything, man. Oh, like, the anthem ballad was invented by them. Nobody's even come close to that. Yeah, yeah. I I love the movie. I don't know if you caught it, the Bohemian Rhapsody movie. I love that. Yes. What that that's one of my favorites there. And then I got a hold of Rocket Man, and me and my wife watched it, and she didn't really care too much for it. But I mean. It was weird. I mean, it's Elton John, but Elton John's talented, a pianoist. I mean, when it comes to piano players, I think of Elton John up there at the top of being like one of the great piano players there, along with uh, Little Richard. And uh, oh, yeah, definitely yes, yeah, Little Richard yeah. for sure. Uh, Screaming Scott Simon was the pianist for Sha Na Na. That dates me also, but yeah, Scott Simon can play the piano. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I love I love music, man. I do too. I listen to everything. I I pretty much have a wide range of music, and it's crazy because if you see my CD player with the uh, with all my CDs in it, it ranges from um, Black Sabbath to Metallica to to Iron Maiden to uh, Willie Nelson <laughs> yep. to yep. Sublime to Oasis, Blues Traveler, Hootie and the Blowfish. Blues I, Traveler, I, yeah. Yeah, I listen I listen to them all. I've been here lately I've been trying to collect like albums that that I that made an impact on my life and the Blues Traveler one recently I picked up the Smashing Pumpkin Siamese Dream because I was a teenager in the 90s so the alternative music scene was an impact. I mean, I got Nirvana, I got that packed away, but still. Everybody got Nirvana, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just it was so impactful there, and um, been a Metallica fan since '91 when I first heard him when I was 14. Black Album came out, been a fan ever since. Went back to all their previous stuff they did in the '80s. I mean, uh, I like. Oh, uh, one is amazing. Yeah, one, one is one is on. It's, it's and I'm a I'm a war and historian and all this. Uh, just one just touched me when it first came out. It's just it's awesome. It has a good story, man. I mean, the story is a guy who gets blown blown up and he's trapped in his body. He can't do nothing, and it's just he wants to die, man. You know, I just yeah. Wow. <laughs> taking my sight, taking my arms, taking my hearing. I don't know if I got that in the right order, but we know you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Intense, intense lyrics, man. Those. I, I like those songs that have those intense lyrics because they tell a story. And I one of my favorite songs is from The Who, uh, Behind Blue Eyes. I love that yep. song. <laughs> I, you know your music. You've, uh, yeah, you're the real deal. You're the yeah. real deal. I've listened to a lot of music over the years, man. I mean, in my 42 years, I've listened to a lot of music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm 50, but, man, you just... You know, it keeps you young, I mean, and, and if you're like me, which we seem like we have a little bit in common here, uh, cerebral music, because the, the most brilliant songs come from the most brilliant minds. Um, so we can talk about rock and roll and stuff like that all day, but yeah, just everybody you named, it, it's, it's, it makes you think. It's music that tells a story. It almost reminds me of like the 60s and 70s, the protest music, is the better the story is told, it just all comes together like a symphony. Yeah, it it does. It does. It tells a story. Every every song that's written or something has a story or it impacts someone in life, and it helps people get through stuff. I mean, I had a breakup one time years years ago with a. I had a two year came out of two year relationship. I was gonna marry this girl, and she uh, dumped me on Valentine's Day, and I just. Just I was so aggravated and upset about everything, and uh, I started like working out a lot, and I listened to just at that time I had on an MP3 player, all that remains, and that helped me get through it. That helped me get through it, man. You know, understand? It, totally. it was music. And music, and when I write, uh, when I write scripts, uh, music, there's usually a song or something that has inspired the thought process before I even start writing the script. Uh, like my first script I wrote was inspired 
the movie wasn't, the script wasn't inspired, but the writing, just starting the writing, was inspired by I'm on Fire by Bruce Springsteen. And to me, I mean, today, that's still one of my favorite songs. Right. I I proposed to my wife with a Bruce Springsteen Tunnel Love plan. <laughs> 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 I did. Oh, wow. I did. I listen to him live every Sunday night. My wife and I will come out here where I'm sitting. We call it the pit. It's just a barbecue area and a little fireplace that I built. But uh, we'll listen to Bruce Springsteen live every Sunday night while we're out here jamming. That's that's amazing. That is, that yeah. is amazing. I like that. I like that. I I pulled that song is because my wife's from New Jersey, and I was like, I need something New Jersey, and I was like, the boss. I was like, Tunnel <laughs> Love. There we go. And I listened to it. I was like, yeah. And uh, that was one of our songs there. I think we, if I could remember, when we got married in 2012, we actually yeah. had that played at our wedding too. So oh nice. Yeah, it was got Bon Jovi. You know. Uh... Living on a prayer or something. <laughs> <laughs> living on a prayer? That yeah. I, I mean, as much as that sounds good though, but living on a prayer, it's like it'd be like, is this marriage, you know, we're praying it's gonna work? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, exactly. He's a Jersey boy too, right? Isn't that mm-hmm. where Bon Jovi's from? Yeah, John he's Bond, still around. Yeah, he's he's from New he's from New Jersey. For Christmas, I got my wife the box set, uh, Bon Jovi box set. I found, and she nice. she loved it. She's like she didn't expect it, and I I gave that to her this past Christmas, and she loved it. She was like, "Wow, I didn't expect this." So I said, "Yeah," and I found one of her favorite things. I stumbled upon at a uh, record store here in Daytona Beach. Um, she was a as a kid, she was a big New Kids on the Block fan. So I'm going through all the CDs and stuff. Like they had a section here at this local record store. It was a clearance section. So I came upon a box set of New Kids on the Block. I'm like, there you go. I was like, I just I was thinking over. I know you're laughing about that, but you know, I just I I because she told me stories and stuff growing up. It's just how much she she seen him in concert as a kid and how much she loved it. So when I came upon right. it, I was like, if I'm getting something, I'm going to get her. So that way she don't get mad at me for going out and spending money on something. It's like, here, I got you something else. But it's the thought, man. It's, it's mm-hmm. so thoughtful to do that. I love it. Um, yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had to think of the wife there when I saw New Kids on the Block. As much as it aggravated me and just got to me as growing up, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to. I'm gonna get this for her because I I just know. <laughs> well, did did she like them when they came back around and they were in KOTV? Because do you remember that? Did did they try like a tour under not New Kids on the Block, but their abbreviation? Ye- I may she- be wrong, but I was thinking that happened for like a brief moment. Yeah, she she did. She watched. She pulled up. She watched the concert and she loved it. And she said it just it brought her back to being a kid when she seen them. She loved that. Yeah. That's, oh, that's, man. Yeah. I love yeah. it. I love nostalgia, man. Love yeah. I, I, I do, too. I do, too. I, I love I love nostalgia. I definitely do. And, I mean, I I listen to music, watch movies. I watch a lot of movies. I, I do. I'm big into the MCU right now because, I mean, that's the big thing there. And being a, a fan of comic books and stuff, and superheroes like Thor and just everything that that they offer with like the movies and stuff i mean disney plus i love how they've put out the two shows of wandavision and falcon and winter soldier i was more excited about falcon and winter soldier coming out because i love the captain america movies i love the yeah. like espionage and the plot twist and the action i mean captain america's all around guy man and just the story and stuff that has to do with like you know, military. I mean, he's a soldier who, you know, signed up for the super soldier, you know, project and he becomes Captain America and he battles the Nazis, the bad guys, Hydra, you know, in the movies and then Red Skull. I mean, just good versus bad. I love those stories there. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Good versus versus bad. Yeah. Good versus evil. I mean, it's just so great. And I've been into that and I, Friend, a friend of mine told me where I can get a bunch of graphic novels, so I picked up uh, a few graphic novels here lately of, like, um, Batman 66 versus, uh, meets Wonder Woman 77. I've been reading that. That's been a great story. 
I mean, when I'm reading it and I'm reading Batman captions, I can hear Adam West, you know, when I'm reading. Yeah, and, and definitely. Then, and then it has the dialogue with Robin, you know, holy jeepers, Batman, and I hear, you know, um, you know, I hear Robin from the TV show and stuff, and it's just from the Adam West uh, Batman. And, yeah, the, the 60s, 70s, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they they drew it just like like you would you've seen them on the TV show, especially Wonder Woman. I mean the uh, um, oh, I forget her name, Carter, uh, Linda Carter. Linda Carter. Linda yeah. Carter. Yeah, they they took her likeness and everything for that uh, for that comic there. So I've been. We were just talking about Wonder Woman today, the Linda Carter version today, while we were on our little scout. Um, yeah, what a coincidence. Yeah, it's. I, I remember watching that man. She'd go over and go fight the bad guys and do the little spin, and all of a sudden it's like Wonder Woman. <laughs> and and the she, technology of that spin was like amazing <laughs> back then. It's yeah. Like, yeah, let's cut right now. All right, let's get you in a different costume. All right, let's roll action. And then <laughs> slice the two pieces of the negative together, and that's movie magic. Yeah, it it, it is. <laughs> it is. I I love that stuff, man. I love that stuff. I still like to get a hold of the uh, old TV show of the Incredible Hulk with um Lou Ferrigno. And Yes. I have a lot of friends who met him at conventions. They said the guy is really nice. You met him before? I met him when I was probably 12 and my dad took me there and I didn't realize he was deaf, so I said something nice to meet you while he was signing my autograph he didn't say anything so i was kind of you know kind of sad bummed out and my dad said no he he's deaf like, what really <laughs> yeah uh, but ironically after that uh when i was 13 i was at music camp and of all things at music camp i met a deaf girl that was doing like the interpreting with the school for the deaf in alabama was interpreting all the songs at the music camp in sign language and uh Kept in touch with her, and then in college, dated um, a deaf girl, and was part of the sign language program at, at my church. So for some reason, I don't know if Lou Ferrigno had anything to do with that, but uh, yeah, some for some reason, I was part of the deaf community after that. Nice, that's that's amazing. Yeah. You said you said Alabama. You have you pretty much lived in Alabama your whole life? You grew up grew up in Alabama. Whereabouts? Yeah, yeah. Grew up, uh, I'm in Birmingham, uh, born in Fairfield, went to a small town high school, Cup Pleasant Grove High School, uh, went to college, graduated from UAB, uh, took me a while to get through it, but I got through it, and uh, yeah, just been here doing my thing and meeting people all over the place, but yeah, I, I stay here and uh, do, do my work from here. That's amazing, That that is. What... Um... What at, at an early early age? What inspired you? Like, what films were you into? What what kind of genre of films were you into growing up as a kid? Uh, well, growing up as a kid, it was all you know. And again, born in seventy, fifty. I'm telling everybody my age of fifty. So we always had the uh, wonderful world of Disney. So growing up, obviously, it was that. During summer, though, when we were kids, like sixth grade and under, we had a little movie theater that every Saturday would have the kids thing where you could go watch. For the love of Benji, um, Swiss Family Robinson, and those. But uh, me and my buddy, named, his name is Jeff Gary, is we started figuring out, okay, it's film, it's movie, we have cameras, and we started shooting stop-motion stuff with our little race cars, little matchbox cars. So I was really into, okay, how did they do that? And I really didn't know, I, and my parents were like, well, it's just TV, that's how they do it. And didn't give me any reason for it, how, how it all worked. So we just used our imagination, and we would pretend. And obviously all those pictures turned out terrible. It's like, okay, now I've got 24 or 36 uh, pictures. What am I supposed to do with this? Flip through it? So it didn't work like we thought it was going to work. <laughs> but, man, it, it was fun doing it. But, no, when I was 13, um, my parents, uh, we watched a movie called Stalag 17, William Holden, 1953, an escape movie similar to The Great Escape. But I always say The Great Escape is the Kevin Costner version of, um, of, of Tombstone. Because, you know, Tombstone was the quicker action, faster Kurt Russell. But then Kevin Costner says, you know what, I'm a little more cerebral than that director. I'm going to make a long two-and-a-half-hour boring version and call it Wyatt Earp. So, yeah, so you have The Great Escape, which is a great movie, but it's a long version of Style Like 17. But Style Like 17, to this day has inspired me on everything that I've ever worked on, if it's a personal project of mine. Um, so I'm, I'm into 
a history. Uh, obviously, we've used the word cerebral. Uh, just, just anything that makes you think. I do like being entertained because I'm like you. I watch, um, you know, the, the superhero movies. I'm not big into a lot of CGI movies, but anything that just tells a story is, that that's my love. That's my passion. I I'm right there with you with the CGI and every, anything that tells like with the story if it has a good story to it because there's films I've watched that have a great story and pe people was like oh I didn't like that and I was like what are you talking about the story was great it told a really good story well it didn't have this much action it it dragged here and stuff and I just I look at it from that point of view from the story if it tells a great story and it has my attention and everything else they add to it is just something just extra to it but CGI if they need if there's if there's a scene where it calls for it that's fine but some movies actually overdo it i mean like yes like i i like the old like alien alien 1 alien 2 you had a guy in a suit running around predator you have a guy in a suit running around and you know running around and just i i like that i like the prosthetics because it comes off more real and then some people some films when it calls you can you could use a prosthetic you know someone in a suit but when they cgi eye it and it don't work it's just like oh man you should have put a guy in a suit man you should have put a guy yep. in a suit <laughs> and i'm so glad you said guy in a suit because here's a little piece of trivia this is kind of fun um again back to the cerebral is i love tom hardy tom hardy to me is one of my I don't think you can say one of my favorite because I think favorite means, you know, singular. It's your favorite. But one of the movies I like most is um, Dunkirk. Dunkirk was amazing. They used CGI minimally when they needed to. But Dunkirk, beautiful story. But uh, The Revenant, if you ever saw The Revenant, I got to work with the blue screen bear stuntman on a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie of all things. But I'm like, you're the blue screen bear guy? He said, that was me. And he explained how he was the blue screen that attacked um, Leo DiCaprio and how they rigged him and all that. And I'm like, you know what? That is the kind of stuff that fascinates me. And I guess it goes back to the whole Jeff Gary story is I like, okay, how did you do that? Did, did you set your camera up here and start your stop motion? But, yeah, uh, so working with him and just hearing how they shot the Revenant and that scene was that's where CGI works. And it also works when you know you're going into a CGI movie, like the superhero movies. I'm all for those. But um, CGI to create a bear and knowing the painstaking of what all those artists did to create that fascinated me. That's that I, I'm right there with you. Yeah, that's that that is cool. That that's cool. You got to you got to work with with him, and you got to you know. It's like, how did you do this? <laughs> that because <laughs> yeah, exactly. that scene is an intense man. That it's right there. Un wow, <laughs> unbelievable. And yeah, they had Leo on harnesses from the right side, the left side, and I had crew with the rigging that were just pulling them and pulling them this way. And I think yeah, I think they said he was laying on his back with like um, casters or rollers. I may be wrong on that, but I was thinking that's what he said. Uh, and meanwhile, he's still being attacked by a 220 mount wrestling looking beast kind of guy that's bouncing on him wearing a, a blue leaf tarp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, How do you yeah. say Leo um, approached it? And was he like, was he like, hey, yeah, this is great, man? Or he just was like all hands on this for this? for that scene yeah was... for, for all i know he was just like you know do what you have to to sell this i because i'm i'm sure he was committed so much to that mm -hmm. i'd have to say one of one of my last year i watched for the first time i watched once upon a time in hollywood because yeah it, it was one of my favorite directors quentin tarantino i I love Quentin Tarantino. I love, love what he does with movies. I mean, Pulp Fiction to Inglorious Bastards to um, to Once Upon, Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I love the story and the take on it and stuff. And Leo, I loved him and Brad Pitt in that movie. They were just so great because one of my favorite movies from another one of my favorite directors, David Fincher, Fight Club. 
I read the book, love the book. I read it and watched a movie, and I'm like, this is great. And David Fincher, I, I love the other movie he did with uh, Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Seven. Seven, I, yeah. Seven. And then it really, I was like, wow, this guy can direct some dark stuff. When I watched Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, I was like, wow. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. When I uh, saw that... I said David Fincher is my favorite director for the dark stuff he does, man. <laughs> he has a dark place, and I don't know much about him, but yeah, he, he. And I don't even, I don't even think he has a dark mind. I've never heard anything negative about him like that. But man, he, he knows how to find that, and he, and even, I mean, and part of it is your editor also. But he, he's got a gift, man. He's he's got a gift. He does, he does, and I I loved. I loved how I mean they changed a little bit of the stuff around on Fight Club. It's different from the book because especially when um when Tyler's introduced, it's different in the book from the movie. In the book he meets he meets Tyler on the beach making a sundial. On the movie he meets him on a plane, you know, talking about soap. And yep. they change some things up there, but still the when the book and the story, the book's always my favorite. I mean Always. always. I recently found I haven't read it yet, but I found the movie. I found like the anniversary edition of it. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. One of my favorite Jack Nicholson movies, right there. And I found the book, and the book is like this thick. And I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna sit down and read it uh, because when I watch the special features, I like. I'm one of those guys who get the DVDs or Blu-rays and sit back and watch the special features and listen and how they did this and that. That fascinates me. Like, like yourself there. You, you're like, how how they do this? How they shoot this? How did they went about that? And that that all fa uh, fascinates me. The creativity, oh. you know. Well, a buddy of mine, um, Richard Tyson, that was in the Kindergarten Cop. He played the bad guy. Uh huh. Um, he was also in Three O'clock High. He played Buddy. Uh, Oh, what was Buddy's last name at 3 o'clock high? He was the bully in the high school that picked oh, up everything. Man. Buddy Ravel? Was that it? Buddy I Ravel? I think I have first. not oh, seen that yeah, in years. He, he, a couple of years ago, he was in the play. It might have been last year. No, last year was COVID. year before that, uh, he was Atticus. Is that the right name? Atticus in uh, Cougar's Nest? Is that the right? Am I thinking the right book? No, I'm thinking Kill Mockingbird. Never yeah, mind. Kill Mockingbird. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but he was, yeah, he was, um, Atticus in To Kill a Mockingbird in the play. So Richard Tyson's his name, great actor. Um, he's actually from Alabama, from Mobile. Oh, nice, nice. I remember in Kindergarten Cop as the yeah as the bad guy. Man, he was he was great. He was great as the bad guy. <laughs> oh yeah, you should watch Three O'clock High. And if Richard, if you're listening, because yeah, you are listening, Richard, because I'm gonna send you the link to this. But <laughs> yeah, Buddy Ravel, Buddy Ravel, I don't. Just, uh, I, I hope it's Ravel. I, for some reason, I want to say that, but it was Buddy from Three O'clock High. You just gotta watch that movie. That's a rite of passage movie when you're yeah, when you're that young. I remember when that movie came out when I was about eight or nine years old. I remember like HBO was like playing the hell out of that movie there, Three O'clock High, <laughs> and it was just it was so great. It was so great. I actually want to go back now and watch it because it's, that that was like about the only time I really watched it. I mean, yeah, it was like you know meet meet you you know Three O'clock. You know we're gonna fight. <laughs> <laughs> like every kid uh, yeah, from that generation scared of anybody bigger than him all through middle school or high school. Oh God, eight the eighties had some really good films from like a lot of good stuff. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, like Alien and Aliens. I mean, Bill Paxton. You know, they're coming out of the walls. I mean, great lines. <laughs> Game over, man. I just yeah, we're done. Game. <laughs> Keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he gets the best math lines in the world, and they come out so good. Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, you had you had films that are now considered cult films. One of my other favorite ones was uh, Lost Boys. Lost Boys. I love that, man. I almost I... just said the Lost Boys. Yeah. <laughs> the Lost Boys. I I love that, man, because I mean the the last part of the movie is my favorite. I mean, Death by Stereo. <laughs> I mean, just somebody. I like the movies with the one liners you remember. It's like, hey, you looking for the frozen yogurt bar? It closed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and then. I'm so the, sorry. Oh, wow. 
I mean, no. the best line in that movie is Grandpa. One thing I hate about Shannon and Carl, you know, damn vampires. I mean, just freaking delivered it. And the movie ends. You're like, wow. Grandpa gets the last What about line. the horn when he drove up and then that spear that just goes right, that part of the, I guess, part of the fence. Da -da 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 he just gets pierced. But, yeah, I love that. Love yeah. That 87 was when that came out. Costume, yeah. Like yeah, I was about I was about ten or eleven years old when it came out. That yep. was like the yeah. only bad like like you know R rated movie at that time we can watch because my my stepmom allowed it. My dad was like, I don't know about this, but hell, it's like it's like you get nightmares. You ain't coming in our room. <laughs> my dad, <laughs> my old my dad, Tennessee, ten, go to old con Tennessee country boy redneck man. And he's like, you you get go. scared. Don't call me. He <laughs> don't come running. <laughs> so me and my brother, my stepbrother, that night were like. You know, it's like we closed the windows, you know, make sure we didn't see no one flying in the windows and stuff, though. I mean, that was I was that, that way with Fright Nights. Fright, Fright Night. Night scared me to death. Oh, God. I still to this day cannot stomach the scene where he's shooting his uh, the, the guy and he's bleeding out the maggots and everything. And the, oh, ooh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. God, that's still I still cringe over that. I mean, I'm just like, wow. I mean, yeah. just just that right there. I mean, great, great movie. I never did watch the remake because I'm iffy about remakes. And, uh, I mean, Colin Farrell was in the remake. I mean, I loved movies Carl, Colin Farrell was in. I mean, Phone Booth. I mean, I liked that. That was suspenseful. Great there. Yeah, great movie. Um, but I never did watch the remake. I'm like, I'm I, I love the originals. I mean, hell, like Ghostbusters. I know they tried to bring that back last year with the pandemic. I mean, I mean they did bring back the original cast. I mean, a lot of them, except Rick Moranis, because he's like, I'm retired. It's like, I don't need to act no more. It's like, what'd you do? You, oh, yeah, that's right. You banked all your money making the Honey, I Shrunk the Kid movies. You don't need to act. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who brought the dog? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I wanted to... I, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I wanted to. I was looking forward to seeing that movie last year, but you know, with how everything happened with 2020, it just got delayed. But I mean, yeah. I was looking to see Bill Murray and everyone come back. That you know, that was in the original. You know, first two. You know, Dan Aykroyd. I mean, I mean, got talking about like Dan Aykroyd, Blues Brothers. One of yeah. my favorite movies. There, the just the. Story and how that was shot. I mean, I think to this day, it still holds the record for the most, like the biggest car crash scene in movies. I think. Really? Yeah. I you know, probably does. Um. Well, yeah. You're talking about remakes. As long as you don't say Point Break, because Bodie, my dog, I have two dogs are brothers, and one of them is serious. Come here, Bodie. As I have a Bodie, and it's Patrick Swayze Bodie. It's not whatever the crap this other movie. I tried watching it because it was on television. I turned it on the first 10 minutes. I turned it off the first 15 minutes. Couldn't do anything. Then it came on again because I guess there was some kind of marathon. I tried to watch the last 15 minutes of it. I'm like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. So the remake of Point Break, gosh, it was. But the, the original Point Break, uh, unbelievable. Just could be a campy, cheesy movie about you know surfers that rob a bank and all. But so well done. Captain Bigelow directed it. So well done, and, and she did the Hurt Locker. She's just brilliant anyway. That's that's one movie right there I keep seeing when I go through trying to find something because I'll sit there at night and everyone's asleep and I'm sitting around the couch. I'm going through, like, Netflix, going through every, uh, different type of movies, and I'm looking through, and I keep passing that up, and I was like, I need to sit down and watch this because, I mean... I've watched. I mean, I like. I like. You know, military movies. Um, one of my favorite military movies is uh, Apocalypse Now. I love yep. that because one thing I like about that was I've seen it a few times when uh, before I was in high school, and in my senior year in high school, my history class, there we started talking about you know Vietnam War. So my history teachers like. 
does anyone have a copy of Apocalypse Now? And I was like, I do. <laughs> I was like, my step. I was like, my stepdad. My he had a bunch of war movies on VHS. So I I came home and he was like, can you ask him if we could borrow it for the week? I said, fine. I'll yeah yeah I'll ask him. So I went and asked him, and he was like he was like he's letting you watch that. And I was like, yeah. He wouldn't talk about Vietnam. Well, he here, you should watch this. And I forgot what it was. And I was like, no, he wants Apocalypse Now. That's what we're... He, uh, he's like, all right. And he's like, here. He's like, tell him if he loses it, he owes me. <laughs> so <laughs> I let him watch. I mean, I brought it to school and, um, you know, we gave it to him. And so for his for the whole week or so, everyone that he had, you know, his classes, we all watched Apocalypse Now. So it was it was great getting to watch that. I mean, I love I love that movie. I mean, I love just the story and behind it and how it was shot. And then I mean, you get to see some young actors, a young Harrison Ford, you know, um, Marlon Brando was just yeah cr- creepy. Most blue of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Marlon Brando was just creepy in that movie, man. I mean, just just the intensity. You know when he and it's that low key intensity, and that's what really does it for you. Yeah, yeah, it it does, it does. It has that low key intensity to it. One of one of my favorites there. Um, another another movie um, that I that I like. Another war movie is um, I have it and I've watched it. You know, here and there, whenever I'm trying to look for something to watch, and when I see it, I'm like in my collection. I'm like, you know what? I love this movie. Uh, Saving Private Ryan. I'd love I love how that movie was shot. I mean, it also had one of my favorite actors in it at the time. I mean, he's still one of my favorites, Vin Diesel. I mean, he had that small part in the movie, but still, and just the story behind it there. And I mean, Tom Hanks I, and Matt Damon, and just there it was yeah. just just a just a great movie there. And I love that. I mean, my favorite scene just the intensity when they're you know they got that sniper there and they're trying to get through the town. That right there, I was like. Damn, I'm on the edge of my seat. Like, what's going to happen? You know? Just... Yeah, don't venture out too far, fellas. This t- sniper's got talent. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'll... Corporal Jackson said that. Yep. I, yeah, I love very that. Well done. I mean, it, it, it moved so many veterans that watched it. Uh, I think they said when they showed it in Europe that some of the veterans had to leave because it was just this, this, this happened. This was us. I, I can't watch this. But yeah, it was. It was heralded as as the staple of um, military films. Yeah, when it, when in, when the, they know when it's spot on and not exaggeration yeah. and stuff. I remember, um, like a throwback in the eighties. I was Rambo. I love Rambo. I mean, for the first two movies, I loved uh, the third one. I just I'm like everybody else. I'm just like, uh. But when he Stallone came back with that fourth one. I went out and bought it when it came out in DVD, and I sat there, and, and again, one of those where I watch special features, how they do this and do that and stuff, and from what a lot of people said, I mean, I don't know if you heard this, uh, a lot of, like, veterans that watched it, they said, like, how when people were getting killed and everything, that was just, like, like that, you know, about, like, you know, how when you know they were getting blown up and stuff and just like they were near an explosion you see a part you know fly yeah, here and yeah. there you see the part coming off yeah they said that Stallone captured that there and the um the, the last part of that movie i love was when he gets out there and he starts you know being rambo whipping her ass and he's on that machine gun just gnawing him down yeah. oh my god yeah they they said that they had to shoot that a few times because every time that he was going, the thing, the gun would fall off. They had to cut, and he had to put it back on, go again, cut, because it keeps falling off. They shot that a few, bunch of times for just that one scene, which yeah. I was like, wow. But one of one of my one of my favorites there is Rambo, like the fourth one. I mean, I saw the last one. I got it. My wife gave it to gave it to me for. Um, for Christmas, I mean, I love the story behind it and stuff, though. But I mean, the last, of course, the last part of the movie was like John Rambo. You, you don't mess with a vet. Those, <laughs> I don't know if you saw the last one, the last one that yes, came out. Yes, no, actually, I love that one. The yeah. last one is my yeah. favorite, besides obviously the original First Blood. Yeah, 
because that in that right there in that la- that last movie he did and when when he set all the traps and everything i was like these guys don't know who they're messing with they're, no. they're dead not, i'm going to get you <laughs> whatever the last, I, don't know. I want to take a quick break and let's give a word from our sponsors but i want to kick back a few cold ones with my friends i head over to city limits tap room City Limits Tap Room has a wide selection of TVs to watch your favorite sports, indoor and outdoor seating. They are pet friendly. City Limits Tap Room also has food made fresh to order, and the grilled cheese is excellent. I recommend the grilled cheese and the apple pie cider. The fries on the side, can't go wrong with that, baby. For more information for upcoming events, head over to facebook.com slash city limits tap room. Keep up with the latest shows and content from Podcast City Network over on PodcastCity.net. Follow them on Facebook.com slash Podcast City Network. Twitter at Podcast City Net. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Podcast City Network. On Twitch, Podcast City Network. Podcast City Network, top source for independent podcasting. Be creative, be yourself. You're listening to The Everett Lee Show. Your love for films and everything that, I mean, you, you did mention that you went to college. Did you did you go to college for film, or what did you go to college for? Oh, my. So, not, not even close. Um, when I was a freshman... I graduated. I was 17 when I graduated. I went to Jacksonville State University in Alabama, uh, and I loved being out on my own. Uh, my best friend was my roommate, or one of my best friends was my roommate. Uh, we went to high school together, but I didn't know how to study. I didn't party. I mean, I did, you know, I did stuff, but I, I didn't party. I, I just didn't know how to study. I was on my own, and my mom was a teacher, but she was always tired at the end of the day when I was in high school. And my dad worked nights, so I didn't see him except for on weekends. Right. And. Uh, so I, just, I did not know how to study, so I couldn't grasp, you know, and I, and I was smart. Like I said, I had a scholarship, but I lost my scholarship and um, just couldn't keep the grades up. So I came home, went to UAB, but I had no idea what, because I was always creative and my mind's always going, you know, as you can tell now, in a million directions. And so I decided, okay, graphic design, because I'm a little bit of an artist, I'm a writer, we can combine graphic design with um, advertising and, and copywriting and commercials and billboards. But my graphic design was so poor that um, I can't even think of a comparison. I uh, heard an analogy, but it was bad. But I was always a good writer. So every time we'd have critique in class, and that we might have an advertising agency uh, representative come out. They said, oh, this guy's going to be a writer. And, oh, I can see why this guy wants to be a writer. Just something like that. So I was writing. And uh, so I just started writing commercials, tried to get into advertising. But they always wanted you to get in sales because if you're sales – uh, you, you make money, um, then you can write your own commercials because at that time copywriters, this is the early 90s, were just dying breed. It's now the salesman writes the commercials. Yeah. And I didn't want to be a salesman because it's not about money to me. And, you know, one thing about salesmen, no offense to any salesman, but if you're in, like, advertising sales and you work for Fox, guess what? Fox is the greatest station in the world, and we're going to grow your business. Then you get fired, and then you work for NBC, guess what? NBC, we can make your business grow, and it's the best. Wait a minute, you just said Fox was the best place for my business. Now you're at NBC, and you're saying it's the best. So I just couldn't get into that machine. Yeah. So long story short, as I was just writing, um, married to my first wife then, which I'm not even going to get into that, but she didn't get the support is all I'll say about that. But anyway... Um, so I just started writing scripts and trying to get representation in L.A., so I wrote something that eventually became Firestorm, starring Howie Long about smoke jumpers. And I said, as I said earlier, I'm all about history. I was writing that years ago, 96, 95, 96, and it was supposed to be a drama paying homage to the guy that did, lit the first backfire in history, uh, and that's how smoke jumpers started doing what they're doing now, jumping out of airplanes, let's light a backfire, let it go up the mountain, and the fire's put out. But, of course, more story to it. Well, yeah. they made it this action, and I guess this is where I was Kevin Costner. If I would direct it, it was going to be a drama about the homage to the original 
Backfire Center. Right. So it was, you know, it was uh, Howie Long, and he's not an actor. He's an ex-football player. And, uh, and so I went to go see it. They used some of my nicknames. They used most of my scenes. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is my movie. I'm going to sue somebody. So the Writers Guild of America uh, provides three entertainment lawyers pro bono, and they said, see, who are you going to sue? You don't know which agency did it. You're in Alabama. They're in L.A. It could be the janitor, quote, unquote, the janitor. It could be a disgruntled employee. It could be anybody that took your project and ran with it, learned from it. So then fast forward two years, I met with Kimberly Pierce, the director of Boys Don't Cry, and her director of photography, and they were like, here's how you get into independent filmmaking. Do some horse trading. Uh, find people that have gear, that want to be actors, etc., etc." So we made my first movie, which was terrible, called Under the Sidewalk Moon, but it got me discovered, quote, unquote, by the liaison of the New York International Independent Film and Video Festival, who happened to be from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I happened to have a premiere at the Bama Theater in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and she found me online and was like, Steve, I didn't know anybody was producing movies in Alabama. So now she introduces me to people like George Clooney, Chris Grock, Jennifer Aston, red carpet events in uh, Las Vegas that I didn't get to go to, but that's that other side of the story. And so since then, I just started meeting people in the industry and producing my own no-budget, low-budget indies here, growing the crew in Alabama. And uh, finally, I meet a guy uh, that's in L.A. that's now like a brother to me. And once Alabama passed the tax incentive for films, they started making films here. Because I'm like, dude, you, we have great crew here. We have a film incentive. And he was very pleased. And I know I'm trying to get all this out. But he was very pleased with the Alabama crew, the topography, just everything about film here. And uh, so that was probably 8 to 10. No, that was in 2008. So since then, just been bringing films to Alabama, still producing my own films and networking. But now it's like in L.A. and in the industry, you know, I'm nowhere near a household name. But in the industry, it's such a small circle that if they were saying, hey, you're going to go to Alabama and make a movie, it'll be uh, like uh, hook up with Steve when you get there or call Steve, and, um, and, and he'll help you out, which that – I love because I've been doing this for 20 years and I lost family because of this business and it's through the grace of God that you just you keep going forward and you just keep working through it and um, and now Alabama we were producing uh, at least four films deep in 2017 meaning we had four crews just for Alabama crew right right wow yeah that's, so there you that's... go I was long winded have fun with that <laughs> I did take notes there from your bio on IMDb, which I love. I'm glad they have a site like that because, I mean, a lot of the information I get when I do talk to film directors, I get the information from there. And usually they they let me know it, like it's spot on or if it's not. And pretty much everything you said there was pretty much spot on. Like yeah. under Under the Sidewalk Moon, now having a film, your first film premiering, and how how did that feel? Because it's like you you created this film, and it's like it's premiering right here where you like in the, it basically in the town you 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 live in right or next to yeah. Well, Tuscaloosa yeah. is a little bit further. It's yeah. forty five minutes from Birmingham. Where Alabama plays football, so I'm you know I'm on the western part of Birmingham, sort of southwest. Okay. But no, basically, yeah, hometown Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, close enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it felt I felt cool saying I'm a filmmaker more than I cared about the premiere, if that makes any sense. Because the premiere was to show people what can be done. Not who did it, but what can be done. Because I'm always about the other person. I'll give you the shirt off my back. I will do anything for anybody else long before I do anything for me. Right. So, to have the premiere, it was like, this was done in Alabama. That's all I want people to know about it. This was done in Alabama. You said it, Alabama people. Uh, you know, it, it was, you know, I, I was proud a little bit, but I was more proud that you know what we did, what nobody else is doing, and and something's gonna come of this. Whatever it is, something's gonna come from this. It pretty much was a stepping stone into the direction that you wanted to go, right? Absolutely, because I never started out as an intern, never started as a PA. I started out as a failure in the marketing business. I, I worked. I never got fired or anything like that. But I just couldn't grasp the whole concept of the business world and the corporate world because it's all about 
hey, I need you to do this so our company makes money. I get that part, but it's just that's not for me. You right. know, that's not for me. I'm uh, my dad is a retired teamster. You know, he didn't drive a truck, but he worked for trucking. My mom's a retired teacher. So we're all about giving back, not taking. I don't want to make somebody rich uh, at the expense of selling who I am out. So yeah, this right. was just a stepping stone to. I'm I'm going to keep doing this or die trying. Right. That's that's amazing that I mean you when when I was reading and doing research and pulling stuff up on you I'm I'm hearing about Alabama it like the film in, there's a film industry there's places to film in Alabama Alabama right there it reminded me of Georgia for example you probably know where I'm going with this Georgia they film in Georgia one of the most successful shows on AMC which is The Walking Dead The Walking my aunt lives right down the road from where they filmed The Walking Dead in Georgia. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Austin we, probably lives in my former roommate's neighborhood because he lives over there, too. Uh, down not too, a couple of blocks from where they filmed. He, 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 probably, he probably knows my aunt. He probably... <laughs> I believe it or not. You Barry know. Hendricks, if you're listening to this, which you better be because I'm sharing it with you, too. But, yeah, Barry, Barry Hendricks, good guy. We drove down 16 there, Highway 16, because it, it leads right back to 75, where we can go north or south. And um, on the way going up to Tennessee, we would hit 16 and go to my aunt's. And we passed by. A, I, I was like, I remember that from The Walking Dead. I remember that from The Walking Dead. <laughs> and then go to my aunt's there, you know. And then on the way back, you know, I see it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember the train track scene there with What's Your Name Got the Arrow Shot Through Her Eye right there. I remember when they went up there, there to look. Yeah, I just remember stuff like that because back when I used to used to watch it, I fell off after they introduced Negan. It's just the I watched the first few episodes of that season, and it just I was like, oh, I just I couldn't get into it no more. I was like, I was pretty much done. People's like, dude, you fell off at the wrong time. <laughs> I'm like, I read the comics. I did, I did. I got a hold of the comics and I read read them, and I pretty much knew what was gonna happen. And but um. Besides gotcha. that, there, I just when I when I was hearing about Georgia, you know, it's like Georgia's becoming like the new place. Like a lot of independent filmmakers were going to Georgia. I was like, this yep. is great because they, the way I look at it with that show, Steve, is that they they showed that you don't have to be in California or L.A. to film a movie or a. a TV show. You have the whole world. You got a place just like Georgia. You know, like like you mentioned before we started uh, recording, you were out scouting. You know, Alabama. And I mean, I can think of a little bit of like what the landscape of Alabama is. And I'm sitting there thinking when I was pulling up notes, I'm like, you know what? Alabama would be a really good place to shoot stuff because of the environment and, and just places there. It has a lot of rich history, and yes. you can use that because Alabama does have a lot of history to it. A lot of people who, you know, if you really look into, like, Alabama, I mean, especially, I mean, um, college football, I mean, Alabama kicks <laughs> the crap. Alabama kicks the crap out of my favorite college football team, Volunteers. So, um, you know, I'm hoping one day, you know, they do get the upper hand, though, but Alabama's too damn good. I will give them credit. Oh, yeah. If, uh, I will give them credit, man. They got an ace. It's all recruiting. It yep. is all recruiting. Yeah. No, I'm not an Alabama fan, so I'm with you. I like Tennessee, actually. Yeah, I mean, yep, right there. It's the recruiting, man. I mean, they, 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 got, they, got their, they got their people out there. They get the best, and they have the best, and that's why I like college football. It's more hungry the NFL it's like we hungry yeah. you know we got a lot to prove and I love that I love that like like with the independent film films and stuff it's like a lot of it is really good and I mean really good stuff sometimes to me better than a blockbuster movie and then you got sometimes uh, I was talking with my friend it's like Amazon or any other place that has independent films it's like well, who who allowed them to put this on here, man? <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. Who funded this? How yes. did they get their money? <laughs> yes. Yes. What what the hell, you know? Yeah, I mean exactly. I mean I can understand, you know, doing a fund and campaign and everything to film uh, you know, to for a film, but 
it's like who allowed this to why did amazon allow this on their on their uh on their choices for you know recommendations you know but exactly. <laughs> it's just one of those things there but i was i was looking looking at the other movies that you have there i i do want to ask you before we jump into talking about out of the fight because i do have a lot of questions about that but um ocean did you i, I saw that ocean in 3.3 miles i've seen that name and i've seen it somewhere before and i wanted to ask you a little bit about about those two movies there um if you give a little bit about it um ocean yeah, uh, 3.3 um, miles you, you want to know about it uh, before i jump into it um Ocean, I don't know why it sounds familiar, because a lot of people say that. Uh, three point, maybe, I, I don't know, because there are a lot of ocean movies out. Um, I'll, I'll kind of be general about all these, because we're still working on the distribution side of it. Oh, okay. Uh, three point, yeah, but no, I, I can say some things. That's no problem at all. 3.3 okay. 3 miles. 3.3 3 miles came from, again, I'm old school. Johnny Depp uh, was in an episode of uh, 21 Jump Street. And the episode was called 3.3 Seconds, and it was the episode where he lost his girl. Well, I don't want to say everything about it in case nobody's seen the episode and they like old school TV shows, but he lost his girl in that robbery. Yes. And it was called, the episode was called 3.3 Seconds. I remember I that. Three seconds. So I'm like, you know what? So many titles are just, you know, an adjective here and then, uh, you know, like the flame or whatever. I'm like, what can we do that's a little bit different? And I just remember 3.3. So 3.3 miles is the um, subject of the movie, the, the plot of the movie. Uh, Michael Pere from um, Eddie and the Cruisers is in the movie. He's my lead. Uh, uh, we're now good friends. I hope I can say that, Michael Pere, but um, I'm glad I got introduced to him through my partner in L.A. named Michael Henderson. Great guy. Uh, but he's like, do you have a movie that Michael Pere could be in? I said, I just, actually, actually, I do. I do, I do. And... Um, I'll say this: We shot that thing in four days, and wow. it's a feature film. And we already have distributors that are asking us for it based on the trailer that we've done. Uh, we should be through editing it by the end of this month. My editor just texted me earlier today, and he didn't really have time to read it, but he said, "Sorry, Joe," uh, <laughs> but he said it would be ready by the end of the month. Uh, so we have buyers ready for that. But the, uh, the plot of that is basically Michael Bray is a retired school teacher who's bitter because a year ago today, whatever today happens to be, but a year ago today on the date, he lost his wife to an intruder, and he told his wife on the phone, call 911, so the police will come. The police station is 3.3 miles, I'm doing the ending of the movie now, but he gives a great soliloquy, and it's all, it's, all, it's an homage to Bastogne also, but being a history teacher, but he's like, you live 3.3 miles, you work 3.3 miles, your police station is 3.3 miles to my house. And you couldn't get there. It took you 17 minutes. So he just, he just, he's grief, he's grief stricken because the police could not do their job. And it's not in any ways because I support the police all the way to the bank. I mean, there's good and bad in everybody, but I support the police. But this is more showing that this is real. This could happen, and this is what happens when a good guy like a teacher just kind of loses his mind over everything that he loves because of a short distance and they just couldn't make it and so he just kind of takes it out on the police but you never hate the police but you end up liking this guy he's a bad guy but he's a bad guy that we all have in us because I guarantee you if something happens to my kids 24 and 20 and I'm remarried now but if something happens to my stepkids I don't know I mean we all have that trigger point where yeah. what, what do you do to make it right so that's 3.3 miles. Ocean, without giving it all away, is Ocean was something we had just done out of the fight. I've been with my director of photography since my first movie. He was a uh, film student, like 19 or 20 years old. I was 29, 30 directing. He's 10 years older. Uh, we've been together for 20 years. So we just shot out of the fight, and that took so much out of everybody. I'm like, dude, Joe, we've got to go. His name's Joe Walker. Let's, let's do something unscripted. Let's go down to the beach. Let's get us... A boat, 36-foot boat, we'll bring Karis, Karis Lamb, great actress, and we'll bring in the other actress. And let's just put them on the boat, and here's the story. We just write out the story on paper as we go. So it's me, my director of photography, and my sound guy, and uh, my investor who's also in the film. I'm not supposed to say who my investors are, because now they're going to call him and ask him for money. Anyway, so him, 
and we just go for two days. We shoot on a boat, and the plot is two women are stranded in the middle of the ocean on a boat with no gas, no GPS, no phone, no memory of how they got there, a memory of maybe the night before we were partying with a couple of guys that may or may not have spiked our drinks, and uh, now we don't know what we're doing, but here's, here's enough food to last us for the next two weeks, and we're just drifting. So that's what it's about. And there's some flashbacks because the way Joe edited it is um, it's not it's nonlinear. Um, it, it starts here at the end, and then the beginning, and then the end, and the middle, and the end, and all that. So anyway, right. so that was Ocean, and it was not scripted at all. And we've already sold it. I'm waiting on the contract overseas because it's done so well in the Mediterranean countries that apparently that over there, like I guess Malta is Mediterranean because that was one of the festivals. They like scantily clad, blonde and brunette, uh, bikini wearing women stuck in the middle of the ocean. So it's done. That's that's done wow. well, and I think we're about to sell it domestically also. So that's Ocean, and that's 3.3 miles. Wow, that's I, yeah. I did read some of the plot on that on IMDb with uh, with both both those movies right there, and yes, it already had my attention there. I I like movies that are like that. Uh, when I read I read the plot, I read the story, and I was like, yeah. if it's like you know what, I want to see this, or uh, I'll 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 pass for right now. But when I read both of those, I was like, this is great. I'd love to see both of these. I'd love to see cool. both of them. And cool. when I contacted you, um, when uh, you contacted uh, Podcast Network, you know, talk with the, you know, try to get on one of our shows with uh, like a bunch of our shows there. And when I reached out to you and, and talked with you and you told me about Out of, out of the Fight, um, that's the movie that you're, you know, getting out there and you wanting to people to see you want to bring awareness to it because of the uh, subject matter in the movie yes. well I went on your Facebook there because I was like because we talked we're like yeah let's do an interview okay alright I was like okay alright what film are we talking about I was like I gotta check it out so I went on there and I looked and I was like okay it's out of the fight alright so I pulled it up on Amazon and Amazon was suggested that I should watch it on Tubi TV, which I have. So I have it. So I was like, okay, I can watch it. So I flipped over to that app there. Boom, pulled it right up there when I searched it. And I was like, I know Tubi TV has ads, which I don't. It, they have ads, but not like constant like Hulu. So yeah. I was like, I can do this because... Throughout the course of the movie, I think they played like three advertisements. And that was it. So I was, I was okay. fine. I was fine. And I didn't realize it was on Tubi. I probably need to talk to them about that. But yeah, keep going. Yeah. So I pulled it up there. I, I mean, the the cover and the art, you know, for there out of the fight. I'm like, you're like, okay. When the first impression was, okay, this is a military movie, but what type? And then when I read the plot, I was like, okay, this is. This is something different from what I've seen. But the first movie I, that, when I read the plot, it threw me back to a, a movie that I seen a few years years ago, called Home of the Brave. I don't know if you've seen that. It had Samuel I Jackson. I know the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I I I love that movie because the points of views of people, what they were going through, and how it affected them after coming out of Afghanistan. I mean, I want to, like, Samuel L. Jackson was a doctor, and you saw how everything affected him. 50 Cent, Jessica Biel, I mean, losing an arm and what she went through. And then uh, the one other actor who was like, I want to go back. I want to go back. It, and I felt like when I watched out of the fight, I was thinking of that character from Home of the Brave. It's like, you come home, and it's like, what, you know, I'm a, I'm a soldier, I have to be a soldier. That's what I got out of out of watching this movie was Jason. He went over in Afghanistan where he was out, out there. He felt like, you know, he was doing something and, you know, serving his country and doing, you know, doing, you know, following orders and doing, you know, being a soldier. 
when he comes home, he's not a soldier. You know what I mean? I mean, he's still a soldier, but metaphorically, he is, you know, he's Jason. Over there, yeah, yeah. he was felt like he was like, you know, it's like I'm doing something. And if I'm not over there and I'm not with my boys and my unit, uh, I need to be there because I need because uh, I'm if you understand what I'm saying, metaphorically, that's what I got out of that there. Right. Exactly. There. And I mean, PTSD is I mean, post-traumatic stress disorder is a really, really I mean, that that right there i mean just what the points of views in this movie that um you brought i mean uh, from not from the main uh and you know an antagonist there or you know i'm probably saying that wrong there (laughs) but from the main from his point of view to other points of view of like other characters that come in the movie i mean like for for example i mean um Randy Wayne, I I loved his performance as Jason. I mean, I think I mean he did did great. I mean, is as you know bringing Jason, bringing the character to to the screen. Um, I mean, Jordan Jude is his wife Emily. I mean, she did great trying to you know deal with what he's going Dude, through. She was phenomenal with that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, she just uh, uh, her performance was. I mean, just when it became the stressful moments, man, where she had to break down. You know, it just it was like wow. It just it just it it hit me. I was like, this is real, man. That you you hit. It was real because I was. It's just it was, and then also with um with Randy Randy Mitchell played by uh, yeah, Randy, probably, yeah Chris Chris uh, Mullinax. Am I saying that right? Yeah, Chris Molinax. Chris Molinax. I, I love. I mean, he was a cop, but a former soldier, and he, he understood what uh, what Jason was going through and was trying to help him. And you had all these other people. I mean, like uh, Judy Norton playing a psychiatrist, trying to help help Jason understand stuff. To like, you know, just all these people trying to help him, and Jason's like, "There's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine." But it's like, no, there is something wrong with you. You need yeah. help. Um, it just it just it hit me on all cylinders of like this is real. This is a real thing that happens, and I love the opening of the movie where basically you're like the like right there when you, it said like twenty two veterans a day, they 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 take their lives because it's it's like you're like a like your soldier. You come home. What what is there for you? You know what what's next? You know they. It's just like you. They can't get out of being a soldier because they're a soldier. If if uh, if I'm nailing yeah. that there right with no, everything, just, you've nailed every bit of that. Absolutely. Yeah. It just I. It was just really 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 good dramatic movie. And th- there for a while, I was trying to find something to really watch, and I was I've being a fan of independent movies and then when I got to talk with you the other day and I was like I was like I'm going to sit down I was like I haven't seen a good independent movie in a while and right now it's one of my top favorite independent movies because <laughs> of the subject matter and the realism um how how did this come about because you you wrote this with Judy Norton and Judy yes. Norton I have a little bit of information there she was on the Waltons, which I was like, "Oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool." Yep, that's right. How how did the how did it come about with you and Junie Norton meeting, or did you've you known her for a while? And then yeah, how did yeah, it, how yeah. did this uh, come about? All right, so Judy and I have known each other for years, um, off and on, but as of late, the past five years, closer. We worked together on a movie in North Alabama that a friend of mine, Jeffrey Patterson. Uh, produced. He's from the Gunnersville area, but lived in L.A. for years, and that's how he wanted to come back to his hometown and make a movie. So Judy Norton was a writer with him and their friends. But yeah, so I worked with Judy um, on a project in North Alabama, and uh, we kept in touch. Uh, she, she's just a genuine, sweet lady, and we exchanged emails and phone numbers, and and uh, I just started, you know what, I want to write something that's going to be bigger than me. I want to write something that's going to be bigger than just an independent film, even though it's an independent film. And I started writing on depression because I suffer from depression. My depression was through what I had mentioned earlier, a bad divorce. 
um, that I didn't want, but but she did. And I had daughters. And if you if you look at the number of days that I've seen my two daughters over the course of when they were seven and four to the time they were each eighteen, I saw them less than three hundred days. And you're talking about the only thing I've ever wanted to do in my life was be a dad because that's the only thing I'm good at. I mean, I can do direct films. I'm decent at it. I can bring movies to Alabama. I'm decent at it. But being a dad, I can absolutely, I'll coach. I'll pray with you. I will do anything in the world. I'm there. And I had to make up for it by being dads to kids in the community, even though my kids just live, you know, as the crow flies a mile from my house. And I'm so close to them, I can't see them. So I went through 18-hour days where I would just sleep, 18 hours a day. And I could not function because of the loss of my daughters, because dads and daughters. So then I started writing a movie called The Other Parent, chronicling what I've gone through. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to write something that's bigger than me. Yeah, this is about divorced dads, but um, it's self-serving, and I don't want to do anything self-serving. And then I, I lost a family member to suicide, uh, not veteran suicide, but suicide. I'm not a veteran. Uh, but I started thinking about all my friends that I went to high school with and people that I know that are veterans and people in my community because I'm active in my community and I just see what's going on and God just put on my heart. It's like, you got to do something that's make a difference. So I started doing a, a script about veteran suicide. So Judy and I are like, let's make this real like you were talking about. It's real, it's honest because everything that you watched actually happened. We teamed up with We Are the Mighty, Mission 22, TAPS and other veteran suicide nonprofit organizations and groups. And um, they said, create a Facebook page. We'll share it and we'll get you families. So, families started contacting me as I was writing it. So, I'm sitting here writing the script and I'm interviewing families. And Judy's not doing the interviewing or anything, but I'm getting the stories. So, I'm like 200 and something families. We noticed that every story is the same. And so, we narrowed it down to about 50. It's loosely based off of. Uh, wife in, um, her name's Leanna Lewis, and she is in Denver, Colorado, I think, and um, her situation, and that's, I think Jordan spoke with her to kind of get into her head about what it was like for her um, and her situation, so Jordan was able to bring that honesty out, but that's how I started writing it, and, and what I'll say this, and then you can ask any other questions, is what we learned is there's no Hollywood one single thing that happens to these people. It's not like, oh, well, there's this five-year-old girl, and I uh, went back overseas, and she had a bomb on her, and I had to decide, am I going to shoot her uh, so that my unit lives, or am I going to go try to defeat her? That's Hollywood. <clears throat> and my distributors at the time, because what I do in independent film is I go find distributors first that might be interested in, because that's what you need to do first. Right. Then you try to sell it when they're waiting for it. And they kept saying, well, no, you need this for the beginning and this for the end. I'm like, it's not real. That doesn't really happen that way. They wanted at the end of the movie, which I won't say anything about my ending, but they wanted it to be this over-the-top. He busts through the door, and he finds the safe house, and then he rambos open his vest, and he's got a grenade here, and he's got a grenade here, and we're just going to blow everybody up. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think a soldier would do that. 200 people I've interviewed, nobody says that. Yeah. So everything that we wrote was real. It actually happened. The only thing that's not true in the story is Jason never knew Barry. What happened with Barry in his situation happened. What happened with Joe in his situation happened. But the main character and Barry never met. But their situations are identical. They just, they've never been friends. Other than that, everything that you saw in it really happened. And, <coughs> excuse me real quick, I had a dry throat, not COVID. Um, all the uh, the battle scenes were done and coordinated by a group of combat veterans from Mississippi. So every battle scene that you see um, is done exactly the way it happened over there. And we shot it kind of documentary style to pull yourself into it. But that was all real, except for obviously Jason, Randy Wayne is an actor, not a veteran. But everybody else, that's all real. Okay, okay. That answers you. You answered you answered one of my other questions. There was when when the combat scenes there and stuff. Where's Afghanistan? I I kind of figured there when I was watching it there. I was like, this is Alabama, it, it, but you can make it you can make it look like any place in the world. Which I that's what, the beauty of filmmaking, right? You can basically yep. make make any place like there in Alabama. You can where you were at you can make it look like Afghanistan you can make it look like any place in the world which I that's what I love about the beauty of filmmaking but 
I I did like how you shot this, like like especially when they were out on patrol, and then when the during the action there, during when they were when Jason and his unit was getting shot at, and the, how the camera and stuff was going, mm-hmm. it was like it felt like it was like oh oh damn. Where where's this coming from? You know, it's like duck, take cover. You know, you're getting fired at, and just how that right there. And I did like the shots where at the beginning, not give it too much away, when uh, Jason goes into that safe house there in Afghanistan, and when he was uh-huh. in there, and he was pointing out the window that over over the shoulder shot. I love yep. stuff like that. And I love the shot when uh, he's in the van uh, in the truck with Randy right after um, Randy was like, if you're out here 3 o'clock in the morning drinking, <laughs> I can arrest you. Yeah. And then when he's in the truck with him and he's trying to talk to him and you have that outside shot of Jason and then when you have the shot from from Jason's side and then you have Randy and he's kind of blurred in the back there a little bit. Yes. I loved how you did stuff like that. The the sound, the audio sounded great. And just how you shot what what cameras did you use to shoot to shoot this with? Cuz I'm really uh, interested in that. That Joe, see, hey Joe Walker, this is for you, man. Uh, I'll tell Joe what I want, and then he tells me, no, this is what you want. Then we always go with what Joe says. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, that's Joe Walker, probably the best uh, director of photography in the state of Alabama. Anytime there's a film that comes here, they obviously bring their own DPs, but Joe is like, hey, is Joe available? We need him for B camera operator. So um, that's Joe, and we used anamorphic lenses. We actually used a lens, same lenses that they used for um, A Star is Born. So anamorphic lenses makes all the difference, but it's also, it's the director of photography and the editor. My job, I'm a director, and like every other director, is your talent tells the story, your editor tells the story, and your de- director of photography tells the story. And uh, for that particular scene, this is how Joe set it up, and the actual scene came from Chris and um, Randy Wayne. His Molnax came up to me, and said, hey, Moon, I got not, oh, I can't, Chris, I'm not going to do your accent, man. I'm not going to do your dialect. But he's like, hey, Moon, uh, yeah, hey, Moon, man, I, we came up with a C, man, and uh, I want to run this by you. And so he ran it by me, and that whole scene, obviously, we, we had the prop for the uh, the brochure, but where they're talking about, um, we're talking about lines from movies, where you don't have to say anything, all you have to do is listen. That whole thing came from them. It, it was not my script. That was theirs. They used some of my script, but that was all of them. Uh, and, and I thought it was brilliant. I thought that was one of the most moving parts of the movie because in real life, uh, Leanna's husband uh, was walking around drunk at 3 o'clock in the morning in his neighborhood with dogs barking at him. Wow. Wow. That's, 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 that is great. I mean, I, I was like when – when talking talk to a lot of a lot of film directors over the over the years, me doing podcasting, I mean that's kind of like what got me into it. My first guest I've been talking to was film directors, which I still talk to. I mean, I, I talk to independent wrestling, uh, wrestling and independent filmmaking. That's those are my two things for my podcast, and love I I love it because when I talk to the filmmakers and stuff and how they set up a scene, what kind of cameras they use, how they shot this, and like right there, I, I love the fact that they use some of your script, but they improvise there when you know needed, and you're like, yeah, you know, it's it's good. You're 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 awesome director listening to your you know your actors and actors you know actresses oh, throwing you. something at you and saying hey i got an idea what do you think about this and you could be like nah that sucks we're doing it like this or you know it's like hey that's a good idea let's try it you know that's i love that you're like let's try it let's do it i i love well, that I love that. See, what I've learned so much on these other shows that come to Alabama that I'm obviously not directing, but you, you work with somebody and they're directing John Travolta, for example. He's been here twice. Great guy. Um, to watch him say, you know what? I don't think my character would do this. You pick up on these those things as a director. So I might be in the art department or something for one of those movies, but you're still picking up on these things. So you're realizing, you know what? It's 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 the marriage, it's the symphony. Like we were talking about earlier with the music, it's mm-hmm. you know what you are the characters. 
I can tell you what I need, but guess what? You're going to give it to me. It's just like I'm not a chef at all, but if I go um, tell the chef what I want, he's going to give it right to me. I let them do their jobs, and to me, that is – that's filmmaking. It's like – because. I, I'm just here to look behind the monitor and say, yeah, Joe, that looks great. Uh, yeah, Patrick, that sounds great. Um, but, yeah, yeah, you just you let them run with it, and as long as you keep it honest. Um, real quick story I'll say is the scene, without telling what happens, where Emily, which is Jordan Jude, has the breakdown. Yeah. That was one of the first things that we shot. And she's from L.A. She's a great, great lady, great actress. Is she told me she she's just like she's like look tell everybody to stay in that room right there. I need you to come in here and sit with me. Sat down on the couch. She held my hand and two things she said. She started crying and then of course I get emotional because that scene's so emotional. She said thank you for letting me find the voice of this character. The voice meaning you know the soul of this character and thank you for letting me be that person. And she just she was so excited. She just she was so humbled that she became Emily, and that Emily, because to me, Emily is the backbone of the movie. Oh, God, uh, yeah. Jason, hey, Freddie Wayne, I love you, brother, always will. Chris Ballack, same with you. But Emily is the reason why I think I end up writing it the way that I did, because it was always that helpmate. It's not always a soulmate, because there's divorces and things like that, but there's always a helpmate for you. And if you have that helpmate... It's not Hollywood ending where all of a sudden, hey, yeah, everything's uh, rosy. You're never going to have PTSD in your life again. I want the audience to see this and say, you know what? If there is that helpmate, sometimes that's all it is, uh, just to listen. You know what? Let me knock over beer cans. Just let me do that. Uh, sure, there's a point where it's going to go too far, and as you watch the movie, you kind of pick up uh, on what can. Uh, but we're trying to break down the taboo because all the families – and even in the military now, is uh, even during, especially I guess during the Trump administration when he was talking about um, suicide was a problem in the military, is now they don't want it taboo. It's it's no longer taboo. It's no longer, hey, I'm John Travolta. I don't have hair. I'm bald now. It's not taboo anymore. It's let's talk about it. You're not going to lose your rank. You're not going to get uh, forced to retire. Let, let's just get this out in the open because there's never a red flag uh, because I think everything's a red flag. Right. But um, if you are that helpmate, you know when that red flag is about to surrender. And, and it's like, okay, we've got to do something now. And that's why the ending of the movie is, and I, and I want to jump into this too, I know I'm going to get long-winded. Two things. The ending of the movie is based off of TAPS because TAPS, T-A-P-S, is an organization that sends members of the same unit or like units, and they send them out on the weekend, and they'll send them up in the mountains, and they say, hey, you go be you. You know, if y'all want to talk about your experiences, go talk about it. But TAPS is what gets involved when the support groups aren't being effective or aren't working. So that's where that came from, but I'll say this on the production side. Um, there's a couple of scenes that we couldn't shoot, and then we ended up having to edit the stuff that followed those scenes. So the part with Judy and uh, and the phone, and, and she looks at the phone, and she sees what's going on, and Jason says, this is what really happened over there. There was a scene where an actress wasn't available. And so because of budget and time constraints, we couldn't shoot that scene. Right. She was supposed to be at... Um, at a uh, at a meeting that a general that a colonel was giving, and it's the one that Rick, Robert Miano played, great guy. And so Robert Miano was supposed to be covering up something that Jason saw. Yeah. And so this actress that wasn't available was supposed to be videoing it on her phone. And then the scene that we couldn't shoot was Jason looking at the phone, seeing that video. But Emily, when Jason was on the porch, was supposed to see that video. And that was going to be, ah, this is why he's really set off, because he knows what really happened, but but uh, Robert Miano's character is saying this is what happened. So, and and then the last scene with the, with the taps, there was supposed to be a whole group of them, but we couldn't get a group, because I wasn't going to do it with extras, I was going to do it with real um, veterans. I couldn't get enough veterans on the same day that Randy was available so I'm like, you know what, let's just let Randy be taken up there by Mitchell. And even though it's not representing TAPS, it represents what TAPS does. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, so anyway, so there, there, there's a little bit of trivia behind the scenes. That's amazing there, because I was I was wondering about, like, I mean, the flow of the story just went so well. I mean, it, it did. It did. And that, um, during, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but during uh, the uh, garage scene. Yes. Yeah, that was intense right there. I was sitting there, I'm like, oh, no, 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 please, please, no, no, no. You know, I'm just sitting there, and then when I was like, Oh, okay, thank God. And then when um, Emily, I mean, afterwards, just like, I mean, she let it out. I was like, thank God, finally, she let it out. And it's like, yep. what do you do? And then the the scene you're talking about, I mean, I I, I, saw, I was I sat there thinking there. I was like, he's leaving. And then you know what I'm talking about, right? Because when he, yeah, when, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he went at the truck when he stopped, and he was like right here, and he's like, are you sure you want to? And he's like, no, I'll walk. And then not giving too much away, you know, for everyone who hasn't seen it yet, though, but <laughs> right there, and I saw the backpack, and I was like, he's leaving. What the hell, man? I said to myself, I said, uh-uh. And then when I saw what was transpired after, I was like, oh, I get it now. I get it just got to get away get away from everybody yep. get away from anything that hurts you that you're going to use to hurt anyone get away from it all you know just be a, be with be with yourself and god and out in nature that's all i got to say and then of course the ending when um i i loved how it <laughs> ended because when that happened there i was like i was like to, when the impression i left me was at the ending, not giving too much away, was I was like, he's going to be okay. Oh, I'm not going to say that. who. I'm not going to say who who's <laughs> going to be okay, but I was like, it's going to be okay, and it's – Yeah, I was just like, that was that was a good way to end it right there. But, I mean, what, what also at one point was when I uh, heard about, you know, you're talking about Jason and Barry, and then uh, that – that one part where he comes to that the porch part. and he sits down and he looks at Barry and he was like, "Don't ever hit you. Don't ever hit your wife." I love that. And Barry's just sitting there. And in the news following what afterwards, to me, I thought I was like, "Did he do? Did he do it?" Because you know it goes to the garage scene and there oh, he is. He I, I thought I was like, "He snapped! He snapped! Oh my god!" That's oh, what I thought. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, we can't talk too much more yeah, about it. But yeah, but do you know what I'm talking right. about? Because right after that scene with Barry and Jason on the porch, and then you hear about, you know, the news person talking, Barry. and then and then you see Jason in the garage, and then, you know, you know, no one no one can see this because this is audio. But you know what I mean? He's sitting there, you know, like this. And I was yep. like, no, he snapped. <laughs> and that's what I thought. But then I was like, no, it happened the other way around. With... Other way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you saw that, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I yeah. Audio yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's why I like I audio know. right here because that's and then I I was like oh I, I was like so that was a twist for me right there that actually I because I thought it was going this way and then it you it was twist it because that's what I thought my mindset was I was like I was like oh my goodness I was like he did snap he really I mean oh man this is intense I was like oh man he's in so much trouble they're coming after him man I was like Randy's going after him but. That's that's what was my mindset, but then when I saw how everything played out, I was like, played out. "Oh, okay, this is great, this is great." How how long, and how I mean, how many days did it take you to shoot this film, or how many days, uh, weeks, or what? It was it was all of fourteen days. We didn't have any pickups or inserts. Um, I, I think I, I tell everybody it was fifteen days, but I think it was, I think total. It was either 14 or 15 days, because, um, I mean, we've done, I've worked on sets with, like, Bruce Willis with their 18-day shoots, Jason Patrick, 18-day shoots. So, you know, 15 is not unusual uh, by any means, uh -huh. uh, but making our days, I do have to give a shout-out. I had an art department girl that uh, I promoted, I mean, young girl, 19 years old, 
that I promoted the first AD. I don't think she liked that because she wanted to be in the art department. But first AD helps you keep up your schedules. And uh, she kept us on schedule and would work after the, after the, the day was over. Uh, we would make our day. If that's a term we use in the business. Did you make your day? It means you shot everything that you were supposed to. Right. And for the most part, we made every day and didn't have anything that needed to roll over. And then uh, her guy that worked for her in the art department, we bumped him up to the second AD. And because I'm all about giving people chances, you know, because I mean, we we get one we get one time to do things right on this planet. Mm -hmm. And um, if we can help somebody else out, even on the movie set, hey, I'm going to give you a bump in your career. So it helps you, which is great, which is kind of like the movie is. Let's help each other out in, in the film. Uh, but I want to give three quick production notes that I don't, I don't want to forget real quick. Okay. Uh, that we were just talking about. Uh, the ending, Joe Walker, we were, um, we were shooting and, and we were losing the house because the house was scheduled to be bulldozed. Um, so we were losing that house because the Board of Education... Uh, one of the schools had bought it, and they were going to bulldoze it and make it a parking lot. But the guy that owned the bulldozer, he said, I'm going to let you all finish your film. But we were having, this was the last day that anybody was available to work. This is the la uh, the cast, not the crew. And so I'm like, Joe, we're losing daylight. Um, why don't you go? Joe and I have worked together for so long. I, I told you that earlier. Uh, Joe, you go finish. You, you, go, you go film the last scene. I'll stay here uh, with B unit. You go finish that. So my other camera operator, Sterling Williams, great, great camera operator also. I'm like, okay, let's finish up in this house, which is another house, Barry's house. We were filming the Barry scene. Yeah. Uh, we're outside with the Bronco, which is my Bronco, by the way. So we're filming that. Um, and uh, something else that was in the house, because Joe came back in time for that, because uh, it was night. And, yeah, yeah, that was at night. So we're getting ready to set up that shot. So Joe... He directs and shoots that ending, and he's like, Steve, you're not going to believe this. Y'all come here. Y'all come here. So he pulls up on the camera and does a playback, and I'm just melting. Like, like I'm so glad that they always say that things, God lets things happen for a reason. I couldn't have directed that scene. I would I would have screwed that up. And, again, it would have been Joe said, um, yeah, I know what you want, but you really want this. So he, he did the ending. <coughs> and um, side note on that is the guy that did the score – You'll love this. Was the drummer uh, Rocky Gray from Evanescence? Yes. Did an amazing job on that score. Um, and then the other note was uh, the scene inside the garage with Jason Pate. Nobody was allowed in there but Joe. Uh, so my sound guy set up the audio. Um, I told everybody what I wanted, and Joe's like, "I got this. I got this. I got this." So Joe uh, and then the actor were the only ones in there for that, and he just did the playback afterwards. I said, "We're done. That's fantastic." And the last thing, two parts, is I love wonders. A wonder in our business is when the camera just shoots and it doesn't cut and it captures everything in one take, kind of like 1917. Yes, so one of my favorites. If you um, looked at the beginning of the movie, that was a wonder. And it was based off, if you go to YouTube and you type in Marsha Marines, you'll see that same scene within 80 or 90%. We, we, we mimicked that scene because we knew it was real and we knew it was honest. So that scene is based on something that really happened. Uh, so I wanted a wonder to go with that, but we shot it before we shot um, that wonder because we shoot out of sequence based on availability, and Jordan was avail available first. So one of the first scenes we shot was the one where she does have the breakdown, and it's the wonder where she ends up on the couch. Yeah. And I love doing wonders. Because and the other one was when the newscast lady, uh, Andrea Andrea Lindenberg, yes. the local newscaster in Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, because you see what they see. If yeah. we set up a camera and set up the shots, and we have two cameras here, and we have four different angles, then we're spoon feeding you. But if she gets the news and you're following her all the way from the time she gets that piece of paper to going on the air, and she's saying, "I don't want to be the news. I don't want to do this." That cannot be told unless you're doing it in one take. Yes. So to watch Jordan have her breakdown in one take, you're seeing what's going on in her life and in her mind and the stuff that she still has a daughter to take care of and to clean up the, the toys and the dollhouse and the laundry and then to watch him, you know, he's just walking around at the beginning of the movie and we're seeing what he sees and suddenly he hears talking and gunfire in the distance and guess what we got to go see that 
Yeah. So those are little production notes. So that's why we shot it in the style that we shot it in also. Yeah, I noticed that with the news reporter going about to uh, go live for the breaking news, that right there, that was neat right there, how you shot that. Just one one take there. And then, you yep. know, like like the beginning with the, when they're going through, I mean, I love that. I mean, you mentioned 1917. I sat down and watched that uh, last year. I love that, how they sh- did the one, one take, but... You know the how they made it look one take, which was multiple shots, but still the way movie magic how they made it look like one continuous thing. That's yep. what I loved about it. How about that movie? Can I right throw this there. in real quick before you ask anything? Because mm-hmm. uh, I'll forget. We just finished, and this was some like Birmingham Southern College, is a college down here, some college interns. We just finished an entire feature film um, that we shot in one take. An entire feature action film, shoot 'em up, one take, hour and seventeen minutes long, um, and it's called The Finder. I won't get into the details because we're still talking about this movie, but one take, and it's not the fake takes. It's one solid take for an hour and seventeen minutes, shoot 'em up action film, one take. Wow. We're the only people in America that I know of that's done it. There's a guy in Japan that did one, uh, but I think I mean I haven't read anybody else doing one, but we we just did one. Oh, that's amazing! I I'd, I'd love to see that there. I definitely love to see that. <laughs> I'll send you a link when it's done. We're still um, um, you're talking about filming anything you can film in Birmingham, mm-hmm. uh, and then Alabama is a good place to film. Uh, the opening scene is I've got a partner, and I'll say his name too. Kostov is a partner of mine in India, and he runs VFX uh, artists that have done everything from 2012 to the latest um. Uh, Terminator 2, Terminator movies, they do all the CGI or big budget films. So he put in, or he was the the, the, the VFX supervisor over the artist that CGI'd my mountains in. So all the mountains that you see, except for the side shot, uh-huh. everything else you see um, was all him. So that And that was the hardest thing in the world that they did because the tracking, especially when you're doing handheld, um, you literally have to track the motion that you're cutting out and then post those mountains in. So that took about three months to get that done. So, okay. Um, yeah, okay. I'm going somewhere with that, but my beautiful wife just came out. You know, go to bed. Right. Sorry, you had to see that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so, yeah, so we had uh, some CGI done for that. So, yeah, let's talk about the, the, the Warner movie that we shot. So yes. I had a couple of shadows that showed up. Uh, so they're out in Croatia and India now getting rid of the shadows. And as soon as that's done, I'll send you over a link and you can watch the movie. Okay. I, d- I definitely do. I, I mean, I'd love, I'd love to definitely love to see that there out of the fight. This was great. I mean, just like I mentioned before, you hit the realism with this man and you bring awareness to this there. And, um, one thing I will have to say is, um, you, at the end of the movie, you do want to watch the credits because of every I, I loved, I loved that right there of like everyone that you mentioned from alphabetical order all the way down to the last alphabet right there with their pictures of these real, real soldiers who served their country and um, what we've we've lost because of this right here. You know, it's it's a real thing. It's a real thing, and there is there is ways to get help. There is ways to get help because one one thing about this movie is um, Steve that I hope that someone watches this, and if they know someone who's going through PTSD, I hope that they can get that person or you know that loved one or someone they know, friend, relative, they can get them the help they need to you know get through this because the words randy said was you're out of the fight but the war's not over but one day you will be and that right there and what was seen i'm talking about there when um what's his name had his backpack that right yeah. there that i was like that's pretty much the whole right there he nailed like the theme to me of like the whole movie that right there r- r- randy said that i was like dead on i agree right there and I love that line because it's true he's speaking the truth and it is because 
someone someone that you know that you know that suffering PTSD get them the help yeah and and look for those signs and yeah. again it's not going to be one particular sign because they're going to come back changed anyway but when you see that what you're not when, when you see what you're doing is no longer affecting anything it doesn't have to fix anything but when it's no longer affecting it because uh, you can let some things run their course, and that's why I didn't want to show a whole lot of pill popping and alcohol because they don't just come home and all of a sudden, you know, they're, oh, I'm drunk all the time, and here's my handy little flask in my jacket. It doesn't work that way. Right. Um, but when, when it gets beyond, he's no longer hearing me. Yeah. And when you're no longer hearing what somebody's saying, that's the time you, you, better, you better do something. Yes. You better do something. Not an intervention maybe, but... You have to do something. Yeah, you you definitely do, and you nailed that message right there. And it's something like like you mentioned before. It is just like this happens. This happens. Yeah. War changes people. What they go through and what they see that um, they that other people that they can talk to that that's went through it can help them get through it. Because I mean, Randy. We tried to help Jason for, I mean, you know, Randy went through the same thing. He got through it, and it was like, okay, you're going through the same thing I'm going through, brother. Come with me. I'm going to get you to help. You know, I mean, I mean, fantastic film. I can, I can watch it again. Just Thank watch you. it again, man. <laughs> well, um, please do so I can make my investors happy because <laughs> every time you watch it, except for not to be apparently, I need to. I need to go figure out what's going on with that. But no, it, the, the bottom line is, is there is hope because I think if you look at everybody, because we don't have the draft anymore, but everybody that goes into the service, I won't say everybody, but most people that go into the service, they have a servant's heart. That's what they, I mean, some people may go because I'm not going to college, what else am I going to do? But for the most part, you're in the military because you want to serve. You have a servant's heart. And when you come home, and like the part about the refrigerator and Mr. Bailey, well, he's going to fix it. Well, I can fix it. I know you can, honey. Is you still want to serve. And I think that if, if, and I was talking to somebody the other day about this, if America just had some kind of, colleges have job placement programs. Right. America needs to have a, you know, we're going to give you a servant. I don't, I don't know how. Like to me, one of my solutions was these guys want to serve. Let's go put them on the border. You know, I don't want to get into politics and that because I don't care about the politics. These are human beings. Let's go put them on the border. These guys want to help. And I promise you, if you are in the military, you are dedicated to service. And you're not going to play the political game if you're down there on that border. So put them up in housing, our guys, and let, and let them patrol the border. Or find a way that there is a service program that you can say, okay, here, we're going to have these things lined up that if you want to be involved, almost like an aptitude thing, that you you may want to serve big brothers, big sisters, but let's get them back serving to where what they're doing is making a difference. Even if it's fixing a refrigerator, that's serving. Let them do that. Right, right. I, I agree with you right there. Let them do something. Let them do something. Yeah. And again... <laughs> <laughs> I this this this, this right there this I mean it just it had me on the edge of my seat there moments there I was like I want, what's going to happen next you know what's going to happen to Jason is like is this going to happen that going to happen how's how's Judy going to handle this and really really well written um okay. just just a great movie and people listen to this uh episode please <laughs> if you're looking for something to watch you want to see something good that hits home and it's real this is the movie you need to watch <laughs> Thank this you. Yeah, is expecting hollywood and big budget shootouts and things uh, it's, that's not honest we could have gone that route but yeah this the, your, your word said it all thank you thank you thank you i appreciate that man i definitely appreciate that one one other film i pulled up on imdb i want to ask you about right Right here before we take it home. My name is Ara. It's said that you're filming it right now. What uh, what can you tell me about that film? All right. I'll, well, first I'll say this. My name is Araya. 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 Okay. I, okay. I, 
correcting people, but yeah, my name is. A, what am I saying? I love. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> my name is Araya. All right, that one is put on hold. That got put on hold because of COVID, but we didn't change it on IMDb. Uh-huh. Uh, but we started shooting some of that when I posted it. What I can say about this is "Girl with the Dragon Tattoo." If you like "Girl with the Dragon Tattoo," the style and and that energy and that vengeance, that's what my name is Araya. Um, and I can send you a link to like like the promo stuff that we've been doing. But basically, it's a girl that's had enough. It's a girl that's had enough of the Epsteins in the world, had enough of the uh, cover-up that we all know is cover-up. I don't care what side of the political coin you're on. You should be able I, I, I'm my, my mom raised me. My parents raised me this way, but especially my mom. If my son did something wrong, I'm going to throw him under the bus. He did something wrong. But there's so many families out there. No, no, not my kid. So where I was going with that is, is Democrats and Republicans both know that there was something going on with the election. Okay, we get that. So Araya exposes all this. No, Epstein did not kill himself. So all these things that are happening politically that we all know as regular Joe and Jane America, Jane Doe, Joe to whatever, right. blow, is she finds a way because she prob- probably, without her backstory, might be former CIA, but she knows how to expose everything that's going on so she does, but nobody cares about it. So guess what? She takes the law into her own hands with all these Epsteins, with all these people that are covering things up, and she takes, and it's not, you know, it, it's Girl the Dragon Tattoo. It's that kind of justice. It's not like cheesy, um, you know, B-movie, even though it's low budget. But it's, um, yeah, she she takes the law into her own hands on the people that deserve it, that the government's not even doing anything about Oh, nice, nice. I, yeah, I definitely, definitely want to see that right there. I, 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 you got my interest right there when you said "girl with a dragon tattoo." I know exactly, and then the, what you just that's described what right there. It. I watched it over yeah. and over while I was writing it, so that I could mimic some of the not the scenes, but the dynamic. And yeah. uh, I got a great actress out of um, Gulf Shores, Alabama, that's playing the lead, and uh, big, no, oh, not big, tall, tall girl. Uh, lean, lanky, kind of, not really lanky, but just girl with a dragon tattoo. I don't know how you describe her, but not big, muscular, superhero, just Joe Average. Right, right. That's that's amazing. So you pretty much have that going on right now. I mean, you're still kind of filming that um, right now. What what else What else do you have uh, going on? I mean, and I know we talked right. about those other films, but... Um, yeah, I, I have two big ones that are coming to Birmingham now that I'm helping produce, but these are these are big shows. I'm not the director or anything like that, so I won't say anything about those because I, cause I can't. Uh, but, but two big ones, which is great because um, they pay bills. <laughs> but uh, I've got one called Diamond, which I cannot wait. We've had to start it and stop it and start it and stop it so many times. But it's about a 1970s era fictional, fictional female washed up rock star she used to be like you know janice joplin meets jefferson airplane oh, we have okay. music written for it but she's washed up and it all takes place in an hour and a half of her life she performs at her local bar and that's and she used to be big but her dad still travels kind of like a chris christopherson and her ex-husband still travels with her dad so there's all this bitterness oh dad loved you he's still on the road with you I, i'm divorcing you so it turns out that all within that hour and a half that um, she gets the bad news that her dad passed away. And oh. then her she gets the bad news also when her ex-husband comes to tell her the news. And uh, there's one of two ways we're going to do it. We have Sammy Kershaw interested in playing the dad if we make him alive. And they're just estranged. And he comes in because he heard that my dad has six months to live. So he's not dead, he's just dying, but in the end, you see them traveling again, and they're on the road, and they're doing this big, just huge jam concert, kind of like um, uh, Woodstock type thing. So right. there's that option, but right now, Sammy Kershaw, if you are listening, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna email you also, um, come down off your budget, son, I can't afford you. <laughs> <laughs> but he likes the script, and, and he's done it, but Richard Tyson also likes the script and sings, and he's like, yeah, I'll play the dad. So there's a chance that Richard's going to play the dad, and we'll pick this back up. But right now, well, after these two films, uh, and I'll probably wrap with this, is uh, we're doing a werewolf film because one of my distributors that we sent Ocean over to, 
Um, he's like, well, we're more into creature feature type things. Those are big right now. Do you have a creature feature? I said, no, but I'll write one. So now we are, all my producer friends and I, and when I say producer friends, you know, gifted in their area of production, right. we're all producing Luna, which is a werewolf movie with a modern day spin, but it looks like uh, the Lost Boys. So you're not seeing all this werewolf, teen wolf looking stuff from 80s teen wolf, not modern teen wolf. Right, and, right. Uh, so everybody's going to look like the Lost Boys, but they're werewolves, and um, and we're putting the modern spin. And the modern spin is Luna by day is a rock star, and what sets her off is not a full moon. What sets her off is the mosh pit that goes see her in concert, and they say, play the song, full moon, full moon. So when she plays the song, full moon, she turns into full werewolf. Her band members turn into werewolves, and now it's the running of the bulls, and you've got all these high and drunk kids that are watching this concert out in an outdoor concert, that they're getting so high, I don't want to be the one that gets run over by these bulls. I don't want to be the one that gets bitten by the werewolf. So they're loving it, and then they're seeing their friends, ah, oh, look at you, you, yeah, they bit you, you're the next one. And it turns out that the werewolf, um, that's coming to hunt them is Mark Wahlberg's character in Shooter. <laughs> I think it was Shooter. Yeah, yeah, Shooter. Uh, and he, former CIA and also a former sniper, that he was attacked in Afghanistan by a werewolf that the CIA was able to give you a vaccine, because uh, I had to throw that in, that yeah. messed with your RNA, and it turned you into this we got tired of sending our soldiers in to die, so we just created Taliban. Uh, instead of waterboarding them, we made them werewolves. So I'm just bringing everything that's modern and current into this. Wow. I want to sell it. I want to sell it. So the end of it is is the guy, the Mark Wahlberg, realizes, um, what what is it? You're one of us, Michael, is what Kiefer Sutherland says. Yeah. Uh, embrace it. He has to embrace that he's a werewolf, and then he realizes that Fuller is the bad CIA guy, and he has to decide, okay, how do we end this? And then it's kind of like a point break ending where right. he's not coming back kind of thing. But anyway, that that's Luna. That's going to be our next big one. And the last one I'll say, and this will be the last, is we're working on the funding for Bastogne. Uh, Bastogne is the biggest battle during World War II. You know, 16 days over there, we were trapped. Mm-hmm. Seven roads were cut. We had no way out. We had no food. We had no clothing. We were just out of everything, out of ammunition, and we still beat the Germans off in 16 days. Right. And by the time Patton came up from the south, Easy Company said, we didn't need rescuing. I mean, obviously they did, but everybody's like, yeah, Patton came in and saved the day. No, we didn't need him. <laughs> uh, so we're working on Bastogne. Uh, Michael Parade is going to play General McAuliffe in that, and we're probably going to shoot it in Hungary, if that's where the money comes from. Mm-hmm. If not, we'll probably be in New Mexico or Montana. So, the okay. next big, big one is going to be best known. Yeah, you, you sent that to me right there um, when I was talking to you, when I hit you up uh, about scheduling, you know, what we're we're doing tonight right here, uh, talking about uh, movies and talking about out of the fight. You did mention it there on that there too. I was like, oh, that's cool, that's cool, and that's that's great. You got more information there. I mean, it's it's there amazing. I'll talk way too much. I promise. <laughs> I talk a lot. That's why I do podcasting. <laughs> but Steve, this is this has been great. This has been great. You you sound really busy. You got a lot of stuff going on and. I love to get you back on when um, you have your have another project. One of the projects that you mentioned that you're doing right now, when that's up and ready, about to be released, love to come back on and promote that and talk about that, man. This has been great. Awesome. This has been great. A good conversation time, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Tell your uh, listeners out there that you know it's on all of the digital platforms, the Amazons, iTunes, and all of that. And, Share it with your friends, and the last thing I'll say about Out of the Fight, please go to the Facebook page because because of distribution, distribution cut some of the credits. Uh, if you go to the Out of the Fight Facebook page, look on your videos. Under videos, look for the longest one. I think it's 13 minutes and 48 seconds. You're going to see everyone that was involved behind the scenes that helped make this movie. Every family is represented by their 
loved one in that 13 minute video. So everybody that has anything to do with Out of the Fight is right there. They're, nice. They deserve the honor. They they do they do they do. I I love that. So I I am gonna have to go go on the Facebook page and page and check that out. So out of the flight, out of the fight. I want to say out of the flight all the time. Yeah. <laughs> out of the fight. <laughs> Is on Facebook there, and that's um, what out of the fight on uh, Facebook.com slash out of the fight. Probably, if not, you can Google it, uh, okay. or I can send you a link, and we can somehow, you know, let everybody. I don't know how we do all that, but yeah, um, okay. I, I can do that. Okay, and contacting you, um, how? What's the best way to contact you on social media? Yeah, what What is your fine. social media? Yeah, if you find me on Facebook, I'm Steve Moon, uh, UAB, I think is what comes up to my college. It's got my daughter, I was 16 back then, with her arms around me, and I had some hair coming out of my hat. Uh, that's me. Um, I would rather you find me on Facebook through Out of the Fight, just so I can keep up who is, who's coming from where. Uh, but just, yeah, Google Facebook Out of the Fight. It should be easy to find. I'm not technology guy kind of thing, uh, but, but yeah, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Okay, nice, nice. Again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, man. I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, Steve Boone, for coming on the podcast. You can find Out of the Fight over on Amazon Prime and Tubi TV and other platforms on any streaming device that you have there. You can follow Steve Moon over on Facebook, and you can keep up with the latest podcast of the Everett Lee Show over on podbeam.com, Stitcher Radio, iHeart Radio, Amazon Music, and iTunes. And that is it. And thank you for downloading and listening to this podcast. We'll see you again next time for another episode of The Everett Lee Show. (laughs) 